So we continue with module 11 as we move into web scraping and APIs. Uh, and what that really means is that we are uh, moving deeper and deeper into our kind of core data science material. So once again, much, much like with uh, reporting and web apps, you're going to find more of this to be a bit unfamiliar uh, because it really requires a pretty broad sort of general understanding of how the internet works, of how uh, basic technologies function in, uh, in this kind of space. And if you don't have that background, then you're going to have a much bigger jump to make. Uh, whereas when we're talking about statistics, a lot of people coming from the data science space have very little exposure, if any, to statistics, so it's brand new to them. We face the opposite problem in the social sciences where we're okay with the statistics part, which is, okay, how do I make that work in, uh, in R or in Python or whatever we might be using? Uh, whereas uh, here, everything is brand new. So most, most of us probably have not, for example, built a web page from scratch. And that's a very common experience for somebody who's tinkered with uh, kind of basic hacking over for many years. So there's gonna be a little bit more of a jump here. I'm gonna point out where there are supplementary and secondary skill sets that would be helpful to you uh, if you did wanna pursue this a little bit more than what I'm gonna cover, but this should be enough to get you started with basic web scraping and basic API access, where if you want to create a data set from the internet, this should give you enough to get there. So. Um, that means we're going to cover four basic ideas. Uh, first, we're going to talk about what APIs are and how they work, uh, why you care about APIs, uh, and believe me, you do if you want to create uh, web-based uh, data sets. Two, how do you actually craft an API query? So how do you ask a question of an API and, and get a data set back? Uh, three, how do you use uh, libraries to just do this for you so that you don't have to do too much of the on-the-ground uh, difficult coding to make it happen? And finally, if there is no API, how do we actually do web scraping? So how do we grab raw data from web pages uh, and convert them into structured data sets in R? So we'll cover each of those one by one. Uh, as for what is an API, which I've said several times now, that is an application programming interface. That means literally what it says. It's an interface into an application, and it's a language, essentially a programming language, for talking to that application. Uh, you can think of it as a data gateway. What companies do is they create APIs so that other companies can access their data sets in real time with the level of permissions and access that they want them to have. Uh, it is pretty much universally intended for this kind of cross-system interaction. So say, for example, that you go to a web page and you see a button, and uh, this says like, and it says like a 18 and a little thumbs up. You know immediately that's, oh, that's a Facebook like, and clicking on that like button will cause Facebook to register a like for me for this page. But how does the web page you're on know how to talk to Facebook? That's the API. So what that website is actually doing is whenever you click on that like button, actually the first time you load the web page, what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I'm gonna log in under my, it's Facebook account, the web page's Facebook account, uh, it's API account specifically. And then it's gonna go in and say, okay, how many, page, how many likes does my page currently have? It gets that number and then it pulls that back in real time and draw and uh, instructs it to draw that little like symbol as well as the number of likes that it currently has. When you click on it, it checks to see, are you logged into Facebook? Uh, it says, okay, you are logged into Facebook. What's your ID? Okay, here's your ID number. Uh, do I have permission in order to increase the, like, the, the likes for you as an individual by one? Yes, communicate back to the web page, increase their like number by one, and then update that number on the page. All of that happens behind the scenes through these APIs talking to each other where the system, uh, the web page that you're looking at, is essentially sending requests to Facebook's API, it's getting data back, and then once it, or it's, it's processing those data, and then it's sending data back to the web page so that it can process it and do something with it. When you wanna collect data from the internet through APIs, you are essentially piggybacking on a system that is not intended for what you're going to use it for. You're going to use it in order to curate data sets. 
And that is something that these APIs are intended to do, but not by independent researchers. It's usually by other websites. If you think about, uh, for example, web pages that capitalize on Google Maps, where they put extra layers on top of Google Maps and say, oh, I have a custom map that I've generated that allows you to plot special points or special routes between all these bits of this pieces on the map. What's really happening is there's data sets flying back and forth between the website you're on and the Google Maps API. So you're, you're essentially identifying APIs that already have the data you want and then using those APIs in order to grab the data that you need for your research project. Uh, that's okay. There's a little bit of an ethical gray area, and that's a, a consistent theme you will notice in talking about web scraping and API access, where is it really okay that you're using this for something that it's not uh, intended to be used for? Mm, arguable, either way. Uh, but simultaneously, are you using anywhere close to the resources required uh, for an actual, if you were an actual website, which legitimately does get to access these things for free? That Google Maps API that I just mentioned, for example, is sending literally hundreds of requests back and forth in order to develop this custom little, you know, clicky maps that you want. You, on the other hand, are probably just going to send one or two requests. It's going to take a fraction of a fraction of a second. Uh, is that really any burden on the website? Probably not. Not really. Um, so it, we, we fall in this kind of space of, it's very similar to fair use conceptually, where much as you can photocopy a picture out of a book for use in a class or in your research, and as long as it's a page, like, does that really hurt the publisher? No, probably not. I guess that makes it okay. This is the same sign of idea. As long as you're using it for research purposes and specifically non-profit research pr purposes, then I think the ethical case is a little clearer. But it is important regardless to have a conceptualization of what's going on, to know that you are in fact piggybacking on a process meant for somebody else. You're using resources intended for somebody else, even if you're using a very small amount of them. And that overarching realization should drive a lot of your decision making when it comes to the way that you use APIs and the way that you do web scraping. So APIs. Let's first dive into a real API. And by a real API, I mean an API that I made. So you see uh, a website here, uh, scraping.tntlab.org slash add.php. This is a literal API which I created myself on my server. I wrote it. I would like you to take a moment and go to this, go to this uh, website in your, on the web page and see what happens. Uh, and what you should see is this right here. You should see you didn't set X and Y. You got there? So once you get to this point, you might ask yourself, okay, well then how do I set X and Y? And what we're gonna do is craft uh, what's called a Git query by modifying the URL and adding a question mark. That changes our URL into not just a web request, because uh, right now that's what it is. It's, it is go to the scraping.tntlab.org server and then find the file called add.php and display whatever you get back. We're going to change that request into a in, in, into a, a, a data a, a method that delivers data to the other web page. So this is called a get request, and I do that by adding that question mark. So now I'm able to put in variable value pairs into the URL. So you can see in the question in the uh, prompt here it says you didn't set x and y. Okay, well let's set x and y. So to add a variable, we simply type the variable's name, equal sign, and then the value that we want it to have. So let's say uh, George, okay? If I hit enter on this, I still didn't set X and Y. It's sent back, you didn't set X and Y. Oh, that makes sense. We need to add a second variable. So we're gonna modify the request up here. We have, and again, remember, question mark indicates there's a get query. Then we have a variable, then we have a value. To add a second one, we're gonna add an ampersand to say, okay, start of second variable. And this one says, you didn't set X and Y, so let me set one called Y equals two, enter. Ah, the, the message changed. Now, instead of saying you didn't set X and Y, it says X and Y must be numbers. Oh, of course. Well, we set X to George and we set Y to two, so George is obviously not a number. So what happens if we change George into an eight? Ah, the sum of eight and two is 10. Well, great. Now we actually have some output from this API. Now let's go back and say there was a couple other, there was one other form right here at the bottom. You can see ampersand format equals CSV. Let's try that just to see what it does. Format equals CSV and hit enter. 
And you can see, ah, I'm actually getting back the three pieces of data I just uh, that I was just looking at, but not in a text form. You see 8, 2, 10. And that would be a very convenient format if we were trying to manually build a CSV file like the ones that we typically input and output from R, right? So why does this API work this way? Why did I have to enter format equals CSV? Is that a standard thing for APIs? Do I always have a format line? Uh, is it limited to just sending numbers in and out? The answer to all of that, um, oh, actually, before we get to that, let me, let me give you a couple other terms that we skipped over. So I mentioned get requests. Uh, that's the kind that's in the URL. There's also an alternative called a post request, which is a little bit more complicated. We're not going to talk about post requests in here, but just notice in the future, if you're trying to access an API and it asks for a, uh, it asks for a post, then that means you're going to use a slightly different format than what we did here. Uh, queries, I've used that term a couple times. That just refers to the string of variables that, is be that are being sent and the data that, get co that come back. Uh, and sometimes you're also going to see REST, which is just an acronym uh, that refers to this entire basic system, uh, what we call the stateless API, where you can just send data to an API and get information back. And that's it. It's a single transaction. It's not a long-term series of instructions. So that's all that means. Usually when we work with APIs in social science, we're trying to query REST APIs. And we're usually using GET requests, sometimes using POST requests. And within GET requests, our, our GET requests are always going to be queries. Let's see how all those terms work together. So if you ever see those terms in documentation for APIs, and we'll get to that in a second, uh, just, just keep in mind uh, that they all refer to these specific components uh, of these pieces. So the question I asked you uh, before we got into those terms was, why does this API, this particular API, work the way that it does? Uh, and again, it's because I wrote it that way. You can actually see here the code that I use in a language called PHP, uh, which is a back-end web scripting language. It's a way that, that uh, a lot of web pages are rendered onto the internet, so they react to you in real time. Uh, and this language, if you can actually read through this, you can sort of follow what I did and how the API works as a result. You can see here up, up, up at, the, at the top, uh, I'll tell you those, uh, the bangs mean not, just like in R. If uh, get variable x is not set or... That's our double, see it's a little different than R, but not that different. Or if our get variable Y is not set, then die, which really means just the program ends itself, and display the error, you didn't set X and Y. And that's precisely the behavior that we saw, right? The next is else if, so that's a, that means if this first if didn't catch, then if not a number, or is not numeric X, and it, or is not numeric Y, then die again, X and Y must be numbers. That's exactly the behavior we saw. When we had X as George, we saw that error, which makes sense in the logic of this, which is, again, very similar to R, slightly different in terms of where brackets are and the use of semicolons and uh, where specific symbols are, but you should be able to follow the basic logic of it. Uh, then in the final else, we see sum equals get x plus get y, which at this point we know are both set and are both numbers, so that makes sense. And if there is no format variable set, then die the sum of x and, the, and y is the sum that we just calculated, which is precisely the behavior that we observed when we just ran through these examples. Then you see else if get format equals CSV, and then instead of this text, you can see the, literally the commas or I literally typed in, write a comma in here by adding in this text uh, of quote, comma, quote, right? You also see there's another uh, piece right here that says tab and these backslash Ts. Uh, and as you might guess, instead of commas, then these are tabs. So you create a tab delimited file like a TSV or a DAT file like the kinds that we've used in R in this class already. Uh, at the bottom, it says else die format not recognized. Oh. Well, that means we should be able to observe that behavior if we go back to our query. So let me change this field from CSV to tab. Ah, and that's just what we get. We get the tab delimited file. And what if we enter some nonsense? I bet you know, format not recognized, exactly like the code suggests. The important lesson here, and the one that some people sometimes miss, is that these APIs, again, are coded by the company. There is no obligation to do anything in a standardized fashion, to do anything that makes sense, 
to give you the data formats that you want, to give you access to the things you wanna have access to. All of these decisions are made on a business case basis by the companies whose APIs you're accessing. So that means sometimes APIs don't exist where you wish they did. Sometimes APIs do exist but don't give you the data you want. Sometimes APIs exist and quite literally forbid you from accessing specific types of data. But all of that is in the control of the company that created it, and that is the core lesson here. Uh, don't Sometimes the data you want just aren't there, and that's, that's important to accept. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just means that the business, for whatever reason, didn't think that people would want access to it. And a lot of that does come from this broader idea that these APIs are built for other companies and other websites versus you as a researcher. So the things that you're interested in may or may not be the same things that other companies with websites would be interested in. So just keep all that in mind. Anytime that you uh, want to download data from an API, the most straightforward way is simply to download that file uh, from the web directly. Uh, that's going to be the easiest option. So you can do that using the um, uh, read underscore CSV, uh, read underscore TSV, and read underscore the limb. Uh, and they will actually grab web pages if you spit those, uh, if you send web pages into those requests. They will actually say, oh, hey, that's a web page. I should grab it and I should put it into a file. So let's, uh, for example, see if we can uh, do that real quick. Um, let's see. This is going to be a CSV file, this 8, 2, and 10. I'm going to copy that web address. And then I'm going to say read underscore CSV. And I'm going to put that into downloaded CSV. Oh, we got to do tidyverse first. Of course. And you can see it wasn't quite formatted correctly because it doesn't have a header row. But we end up with uh, 8, 2, and 10 in the three rows. And I'm just going to real, real quickly look and see how we can get rid of the header row. I think it's head... Oh, call underscore names uh, equals true is by default. So if we do call underscore names equals false, you can see now we actually have this data set and it automatically labeled x1, x2, x3, and here are the three values that came from it. So if you find, if you craft your own Git query, you can actually put in uh, code like this in order to download it straight into R. Very easy. Uh, and what you would do also is if you wanted to get a lot of different files with a lot of different API requests, that means you would need to create a big loop, grabbing one line at a time. And so we'll, we'll go through some of those examples uh, here in a second. Uh, if you're not getting CSVs or TSVs or some other delimited file, you can use download.file as, a, request, as a, a function which will grab individual files, whatever they might be, and then you can process them post hoc. So that's an easy way to do that. Um, if you're using uh, Git requests, uh, there's also a Git function inside HTTR, and there's some advantages to using that versus just putting that straight in the, into uh, as a, a parameter of the read CSV function, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, if you're sending post requests, you'd want to investigate the post command also in HTTR. We're not going to really talk so much about post, um, but it's the same basic idea as what you're going to see in just a second. So here's that uh, request again, and here is an example of manual code that you could use in order to process a, uh, a process a Git request. So you can see the response equals Git, and then that same URL that I was adding before, but without any of the Git parts. So there's no question mark, right? So that means there's not a query, and there's no variable value pairs. You can then see comma user underscore agent and the name of uh, some uh, uh, of uh, kind of a uh, identifier to you, for you to the web page. So the advantage to the reason you want to use user agents is because this is literally your your call sign essentially when you're doing this web scraping. And what happens is every time you send a request, this call sign gets sent along with it. In this happens in your regular web page already. You can, for example, go into your web browser and you can go, what is my user agent? And you'll get to see what your user agent is in the web page. So when I'm moving through Chrome, this is my user agent, which is long and seems nonsensical. But what that's really doing is communicating to the web pages that I'm going to, the web servers that I'm going to, who I, uh, what kind of capabilities that my web browser has. So it basically allows 
uh, those websites to customize the content based on the capabilities of my web browser. That's the purpose of a user agent uh, most of the time. When you are in R, however, there is, uh, there is no user agent in the same way because there's no display, there are no display options. When you are sending a request to a web page from R, R doesn't need to interpret, oh, animation works this way and color works this way. It's just text. So as a result of that, instead of the user agent explaining capabilities, it should be an informative statement that says who you are and what you're doing. So here you can say researcher and your email address. And the reason that that's important is because after the fact, if a web uh, admin sees that there's a big spike in requests. There's a hu huge number of requests coming to their API or coming to a particular website. And they check, they say, who is this? What are they doing? By putting that there, you give them a vector to contact you and say, oh, hey, you're, it's fine to be scraping on our website. It's fine to be doing all these API requests, but I really need you to slow it down uh, or otherwise just communicate with you that there should be a change. If you don't do that, then they can take that IP address and they can just block you and you can be blacklisted from accessing the API or accessing that website. So very important to, act, to represent yourself honestly using user agents or else a lot of unintended consequences are possible. In the next section, you see query equals list, and then a list of the specific parameter uh, and value, uh, parameter field pairs that uh, we wanna send to the uh, API. At the bottom, then there's a, re a reformatting because the, the raw data that come back from a web page versus the data you want in R can be different. And the content function in, this is all in HT, the HTTR library, the content function will automatically kind of reformat that for you into, into a, a format that's useful. And then at that point, you can reformat it however you need in order to get it into uh, a data set that you can use in R itself. So that's just all, all the things that we've already talked about weeks before, data manipulation and altering tables and changing structures and so on. You do whatever you need to do in order to get it into that nice, clean, tidy data set that you want to use for actual analyses. Uh, this gets more complicated if you need to do a series of requests because instead of doing one poll, you're now going to be doing a series of polls. You're going to say, all right, well, instead of what I, what's interesting for my research project is not just one and eight, but I want to do one through 100 and one through 100 on Y, and I want to send a series of 10,000 requests in order to, uh, in, in order to get a, you know, a data set that is useful to me for whatever reason. That means that you th then say, instead of running this entire function, we now need to make this just a sub-function, and we need to call this, uh, this get function those you know, 10,000 times, but we want to change X and Y each time using loops. So if you wanted to do a whole wide range of requests, then you would just modify it uh, in, order to do, in order to do that. Uh, so we'll, we'll, again, we'll show some examples of this in just a second. Uh, an important thing when you do that, though, is what's called error handling, or the creation of graceful code. When you send a request over the internet uh, when you, for a web page, meaning you send an HTTP request, there's a possibility that what you get back is not what you want to get back. For example, when you're sending those requests, perhaps there is unknown to you a limit in terms of the maximum number of requests per hour that the API can receive. And say that limit is 1,000 an hour, and you're sending in requests uh, faster than that. So what will happen if you don't have error handling is it will get to request 1,001. It will then hit, oh, there's an error in sending my request. It's sending me junk back, back now. The whole program will essentially crash, and you will have none of the first 1,000 requests that you sent. Because R only updates data when there is a successful request sent. So you've seen this yourself. If you had a big string, like a big series of requests, and if, you know, let's say you had 10 commands in a function, and it failed on command 10, then nothing gets changed. That's the same here, except that's not usually what you want to have happen because you're expending resources in order to send those requests. So if I send, if I have 1,500 requests to send and I discover there's an error, at, uh, a timing error after request 1,000, I don't want to need to rerun the first 1,000 requests when I try to diagnose what happened. So instead you want error handling. And what error handling then does is it gracefully handles errors. And that can mean different things depending on what you want. In this case, that you for web scraping and API requests, it usually means that instead of throwing an error, 
it will record that an error occurred in the data set. And you have to know some, you have to have some way in mind as to what you want it to say. Uh, if you're using an API R library, and we'll, we'll talk more about those in a minute, um, with, but they're essentially uh, libraries that automate some of this for, for known APIs, you don't usually need to do this by yourself. Uh, so this is purely for this manual error, this manual uh, API pull kind of stuff that we're talking about right now. Uh, that'll be a little different forward. Uh, if you want to really get into this, you all, you're also going to want to learn about what are called HTTP errors, uh, HTTP access failures. Um, you've probably seen one before now in your life, I'm going to guess, and haven't really thought about it, which is an error 404, which is a file not found error. But there are many different types of errors, and they mean different things for your data quality and your data integrity. The one that you're most likely to see is error 403, forbidden. And what a 403 error means is that you have the, uh, uh, the person who owns the server is literally telling you, you are not allowed to access this. And 403 errors are most common when you hit those access limits I was just talking about. Uh, so you'll want to think about all the different ways that your, your code can fail and then build in ways to handle those failures in ways that make sense for your individual project. As a sort of, uh, let's say, prototype for how you might go about this, here's an example of a series of Git requests in terms of scraping uh, data. So at the top, you have the creation of a data set. Uh, values x with uh, first is a request list. So those are the sets of x and y variables we're going to send, 1 through 10 and 11 through 20. Uh, and then the second one, we create a blank tibble called responses where we're going to be storing the answers we get. You then see that uh, that same get request is now situated inside a function called uh, get underscore response, which takes an input x and an input y uh, it uh, provides an update to the console, which is something I really strongly recommend just so you get feedback on how your request is going, uh, which is this right here. Print, paste, x is now, my x, y is now, my y. Uh, then, a, then there's that get request we just sent. And you can see instead of having a raw number in for x and y, we instead have the my y and my, and my x that we got as input into the function. We then have the system sleep for two seconds which is very important. Uh, that, that is how we avoid those access limits that I was talking about earlier. And then here's our error handling for HTTP errors. If HTTP error response, then return as tibble HTTP error. Then if there is no error, return instead the content itself as text. You can then see at the bottom the code that actually runs all of this. It says for row in one to number of rows in request list, so in this case, there's 10 rows. It's 1 and 11, 2 and 12, 3 and uh, 13, all the way up to 10 and 20. So for that number, for 10 rows, for 10 rows, uh, add a new row. That's what bind underscore rows does to our responses tibble, which starts out blank, and add the results of get underscore response. So this is kind of your prototypical series of requests that you would send to an uh, API, uh, like the one that works here. And you can copy paste this and run this for yourself if you would like. Uh, it will just send those 10 requests to my server and then spit back uh, a data set containing the results of all of those requests. Uh, the, uh, the downside to doing it this way is purely the amount of time that it requires in order to code all of these components. And also because in practice, these requests can get really complicated. Not only in terms of sending the request, but in terms of processing the output. The output you see is usually not a CSV. That would be wonderful, but it's not. Usually instead it's something called an XML file, meaning extensible markup language, uh, or JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. The advantage to each of those formats is they are hierarchical in nature. Whereas in a CSV file, everything is by definition on one level. And you can think of this almost like multi-level modeling in a social science sense. Everything is, you know, cases represent people or web pages or whatever. And the top you see variables. In XML or JSON, there are systems in place to dynamically generate multiple levels of data. So you, can, you actually have nesting. So you might have person one, 
as a container, and then information about person one, and then you move back out to person two, and then information about person two, and within that, you can go in further levels, and it's essentially infinite number of levels in and out. Uh, XML, if you see an XML file, will look kind of familiar because it's uh, a specific, uh, modern HTML is a kind of XML. Uh, it's an XML with very specific rules. XML is a much broader idea of using uh, what are called tags in order to mark those that hierarchical uh, data structure. So the specifics of that are not super important uh, unless you're going to be manually processing XML files. And the data that I'm going to show, or the approach I'm going to show you in the rest of today is really about avoiding having to do that as hard as you possibly can. Because once you get into the weeds of processing raw data files like that, uh, that, that is where the programming time just explodes. Whereas if an existing R library is in place that already incorporates all of this, you can do basic API scrapes in a minute. Whereas if you have to really rationally think through all of these edge cases, what are all the different ways that data can come back? What are all the different formats? How do I process it? How do I convert it? That is going to just add an enormous amount of programming time to trying to grab data. Sometimes it is unavoidable, but most of the time for the data sets that social scientists are typically interested in, which usually means things like Twitter data, Facebook data, social media data broadly, um, in mo or, or discussion forums, there's a couple other variations. Uh, for that, those types of data, uh, then you, pr you usually probably don't need to do all of this. But I think it's important regardless, one, to know that it's there so that if you do need it, you can use it, and two, to understand what is kind of going on under the hood in some of the R libraries uh, that do API stuff. Uh, one of the examples is, of the complexity is in terms of rate limits. So Twitter, for example, when you have a Twitter account, a Twitter developer account, uh, limits the number of requests that you can send to 180 calls every 15 minutes for simple requests and 15 calls every 15 minutes for complex requests. So for example, 25 uh, tweets can be returned per simple call, which really means up to 4,500 tweets uh, every 15 minutes. If you're coding your own API access code like we just did, you have to figure out, am I using simple requests or am I using complex requests? What is the actual per second amount of time that I can do in order to send the, the number of requests I want and not hit those rate limits? Uh, you also need to worry about, um, uh, you know, what number of seconds do I need to wait repeat between requests? Sometimes they'll actually mandate, oh, you can only send one request every 90 uh, seconds or every, two, every minute or every 30 seconds or down as low as every two seconds is probably about the minimum you're gonna you're gonna likely see and you have to go look in the documentation and figure out well what is the limit for this particular api and implement it so if there is an existing r library you don't have to do any of that because they've already done it and they've coded it into their uh, software if you do have to deal with the output you receive content is the the best option for for doing that uh, you it converts it into an appropriate uh, class in R based on its guess as to what you're what it's looking at. So if it thinks, oh, this is text, then it will just convert it into text and you don't really need to worry about um, the other information that comes out the back end. Um, you might need to pre-specify it because sometimes it can get tricked. If there's too many, uh, if you have kind of gratuitous uh, less than signs or question marks or other special symbols, sometimes it'll get thrown off into guessing what it thinks those data are. Um, if you are, but yeah, in any case, it can usually figure it out, uh, what it is that it's pulling back and it will, it will work with XML pretty well, most of the time. Uh, so, uh, you might have to play around with it in order to get exactly the format you want out the other end, but it will generally work. Uh, if you end up getting JSON files back, uh, there is an extension for Chrome called JSON Viewer, which I'd strongly recommend. It actually lets you look at raw JSON, and it formats it and uh, uses indentions to make it look a little more readable. And I'm going to show you that on the next slide. Um, and once you get that format, once you get that XML or that JSON file, you can use many different functions in order to actually convert it back down. Uh, JSON lights from JSON is fantastic. For most JSON files, as long as they are correctly formatted, you just throw the entire output that you got from the API into from JSON and it will just magically turn it into a data set. Uh, it works really well most of the time. 
Uh, if you have a poorly formatted JSON file or if you have a very complicated JSON file with like lots of levels and hierarchical nesting and complexity, then it may not work as well. Uh, but most of the time it does. You can also see a variety of functions for XML. Uh, there's also list functions, which you can use for collapsing hierarchical lists. Uh, and bind rows is really great when you're doing that iterative building of data sets, like I showed you an example of earlier. Um, some combination of those is how you get from just raw, randomly formatted data into the format you want. And again, the reason I, this may seem a little less prescriptive than in previous weeks, and the reason for that is because basically every API is different in terms of what it gives you, how it's structured, and why it, stru and why, uh, it looks the way it does. And in a lot of cases, you just have to read the documentation and play with it and say, all right, what happens if I throw the JSON in this format? Okay, now it's corrupt in this way. All right, now let me change this, let me change this. And you engage in a sort of debugging process in order to get to the file formats that you actually want. Uh, in the end. So I, I, can't, I can't really prescribe you a single way to do it because by definition, they're going to be different pretty much every time. And the only cases, the exception to that are the cases with major providers like Facebook and Twitter. And the trade-off there is that when you use a major provider, there are already our libraries available that will do all this stuff for you. So you don't have to worry about it. So we're really only talking about situations where you can't find uh, an existing R library to do the API processing for you. Uh, so yeah, this is an example of a JSON output, which comes from Twitter. You can see how it's hierarchical. You have an overarching data object uh, right here that contains, uh, actually this, sorry, this isn't even Twitter output, this is Facebook output. Uh, you can see an overall data object, and inside the data object is a case that has four pieces of information. It has a message, which is the actual posted information, and this is from an open group called uh, uh, Psychological Methods, uh, or Research Methods in Psychological Science, or something like that. Uh, it's probably in here. Yeah, Psychological Methods Discussion Group. There we go. Uh, this is from that group, and so you, under message, you can see the content of that information. Under story, you can see the title used for that. You can see updated time, which is in UTC, uh, universal, uh, uni uh, universal Time Coordinated. Uh, and you can also see an ID number, which is just a unique identifier for the message. And then we exit out of that object and we go into a new one. And so that's the idea behind JSON, is you have these nested objects inside other objects. And you can also think of how complicated this can get. For example, say that there was a demographic uh, item in here, that could then go one level deeper and have all of the demographics nested for this person. And that means you actually have data sets inside data sets and potentially inside data sets in a JSON or an XML file. And the big task becomes, well, how do I pull apart all those various data sets in ways that are meaningful for the final data set that I want, that most likely a tidy data set uh, for my, my own research purposes. Uh, so let's go through uh, an example of how to do this without having to worry about all of that. Uh, let's instead go to use Twitter. And I mentioned that Twitter is, like, like Facebook, is uh, an example of one of the uh, uh, systems where a lot of, because a lot of people use Twitter and try to get access to data from Twitter, there, is all, there already are libraries to access it, which makes a lot of this much, much simpler, as you will see when we go through the example. Um, so in order to uh, do this, what you're going to, have to do is go to developer.twitter.com slash uh, your language, which if you're in English is slash in slash apps, and you're going to also already need a Twitter account. If you don't already have a Twitter account, this process will probably take you a few days, uh, and I will explain why in just a second. Once you get in, you will not have these uh, existing apps. You should, on this page, sla on the slash apps page, you should see a big blank list but you should see the create an app button on the top right. If you have never logged into developer Twitter before, which you probably haven't, you may also be asked to sign up for a developer account. So that's what you must do. You must sign up for a developer account uh, because again, these things, the purpose of, of APIs is for websites to talk to each other. So you are essentially pretending to be a person with a Twitter app, an app that relies upon Twitter data. Uh, and you can see here I have two, one of which actually is a Twitter app legitimately, which is for my blog, uh, so that my blog can talk to Twitter and update those little tweet counts. Uh, the other is for R, which I've just called R Lander's R interface as just a way for me to access uh, uh, essentially security details in order for me to access 
uh, the Twitter data. So the reason why this might take you a few days if you don't have a Twitter account is because when you sign up for Twitter and then immediately sign up for a developer account, they're going to pretty much assume that you're trying to steal data or you're trying to hack their system or whatever else. And there's going to be an embargo placed upon your account for a few days to make sure that you're a real human being and not, you know, a Russian bot. So that means that this process will take you a little bit of time. Uh, once you do it once, you've done it forever. So that's great. Uh, even if you have a Twitter account already, there may be a delay when you create your app because there's still, gonna, there's still an approval process required. What I would suggest doing, what you need to do is create an app. You can give it whatever name you want. But then in these fields, application description, uh, and at the bottom, tell us how this app will be used. You're going to want to enter literally a sentence or two explaining you know, I'm doing this for uh, to practice learning APIs at the university of whatever. Um, and that's fine. That's enough. That's all you need to do. And you'll probably get the approval for your application within an hour or two. If you're a long-standing Twitter user, it'll go faster because the AI algorithm that they use for approvals uh, prioritizes long-term active accounts. So it's going to be more confident that you are not a bad actor and it will approve your account faster. Whereas if you are an infrequent Twitter user, uh, especially if you have an account and haven't used it for a long time, they may assume that that means that your account has been hacked and you're trying to get access you shouldn't have. Uh, or if you're a brand new Twitter account in particular, uh, in those situations, there may be a longer approval process. But you can basically enter any app name that you want that you'll remember. Uh, again, I use like my name, R Landers, R interface. You can do whatever you want. Application description should be an honest description, at least a sentence, maybe two. Um, for your website, you can just put in the website of your university or the place you work. Um, and for how the app will be used, then you can, uh, again, enter uh, two or three sentences about exactly what you're doing, who you're looking for, and why. And your answer will probably be, I'm learning how to use the Twitter library in R, and so I need access in order to, do, in order to pull tweets for learning uh for learning R. So it, it doesn't need to be good. It doesn't need to be poetry. Just write down literally what you're doing and that'll be fine. And hit create once you're done. Once you have done that, you will see a new entry like this, uh, which will have all the information that you have. And you can see from my description was just used to access Twitter APIs. We we'll use for academic research and for teaching other how to use R. Uh, I even said R's apparently, so they really don't care. Um, and all the other data was uh, empty. The key that you're going to want from this is in this heading called Keys and Tokens. Now, what you see here, which won't be the same by the time that you watch it, are literal passwords used for accessing Twitter. Uh, the reason for this is because Twitter needs some way to identify who you are once you are inside R. So how does it know which account you're logging in under? And the answer is with all of these keys. Uh, and these keys uh, and tokens uh, essentially are all passwords. They're all, they're different, they mean different things in different combinations. It's not really important for our purposes. You're going to need all four, and you're going to need to copy paste all four into uh, our studio. So uh, I am, we're going to use the code that is in this PowerPoint down here. We're going to load the library, and then we are going to add in all four of those. Uh, so I am going to do library Twitter. Then I'm going to take the first one, which I'm going to call API, API. The second one, which I'm going to call API secret. And you can name them whatever you want. It doesn't actually matter. Make sure you don't have those spaces at the end if you just double click to copy. This is uh, access token. And then we have access secret, which is the last one. of that space. And that basically puts those four codes as variables in the uh, uh, into R. And the reason that we do that is so that we can send those four passwords, essentially, when we set up authorization for uh, RStudio to access uh, Twitter. So 
An important note, which is something I'm uh, something I'm going to do as uh, as soon as uh, this uh, is no longer being recorded, is hit the regenerate buttons on here in order to generate brand new passwords so that other people can't access my account. Because again, people can use this for somewhat nefarious purposes, especially if you end up in a place where you're doing some very serious Twitter research and you're actually paying for premium access, which usually isn't necessary for the kind of thing we would do as social scientists, but might be for you and for your individual project, then somebody can log in, use your account, spend your money. It's not very good. Uh, or they can use it to post things to your Twitter account, uh, which is definitely not good um, uh, because this has, uh, as you can see down here, read and write access. And write access essentially means that it can post things on your behalf. It can send direct messages on your behalf and so on. So I'm going to regenerate all of those uh, after we're done here. But uh, just keep that in mind that that's uh, what those are. So we are going to next uh, run through this setup underscore Twitter underscore OAuth. And OAuth is a, uh, a protocol for security. And you're, you might see that term when you're looking in documentation for APIs you want to use. Uh, sometimes OAuth is um, uh, the strategy that they take. And we're going to feed literally all of those uh, terms that we just had up above here. And I could type these all individually. It just makes for a very long uh, function call. So at this point, you might get a question that says, do you want to use direct authentication and use the local disk for caching or something like that? And the answer is yes. Uh, and what's happening is that what's going on in the background is that RStudio is essentially instantiating a web browser and is going and authorizing on that web browser and then keeping that security credential open in the background. And when you, you need to hit one in order to give it permission to do that. Uh, that will be reset every time you exit R and load it back again. So you'll need to give it you'll need to give it permission basically every time that you close R Studio completely down and reopen it back up. But we're now actually authorized. So meaning my R Studio is currently logged into Twitter under my Twitter account because I gave it those four passwords. We're now going to uh, go into use the search Twitter command, uh, and we're going to search for R stats, and we're going to get fifty tweets. Uh, we can see over on the right, we now have a list of 50. Uh, and you can see all of the different formats for this. You see it has a, a status, a text, whether it's been favorited, the counts, replies, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of information. Uh, this particular R library, Twitter, does not send back data in a super useful format. This list is not something that you would use. So we need to further process it in order to get back to something that we would find more valuable. I'm actually first going to, though, run a different function that's included here called strip retweets. Because one of the most common things to do uh, in Twitter, if you're not familiar with Twitter, is to retweet what, uh, retweet what other people say. Uh, and as a social scientist, that may or may not be interesting to your particular research question. For the kind of stuff we do, it's not. So say, for example, that you're interested in the personality of people on Twitter. Well, there's a nice logical case to say, well, the content of what you retweet may not be as reflective of you as a person as the actual tweets are. So we might want to remove them. Alternatively, we might keep all of them and split them apart and run our models separately on the two pieces. It's totally up to you based on the questions that you have of the data that you're looking at. But this uh, particular library does have this strip underscore retweets function, which will pull it all out for you automatically. And then we're going to create a tibble uh, using the Twitter list. Uh, what is it? Twitter list to... It's a very awkwardly capitalized function name. Uh, twit list to data frame function uh, and take our tweets underscore clean and that will actually create, uh, oh, not tweets underscore clean, we want tibble. That will actually create a data set containing the cases that we just looked at. And you can see the actual text of the four people writing the in uh, hash r stats. Uh, and you can see how many times it's been favorited, when it was created, ID numbers, uh, how many people have retweeted them, if there's location data available, which there won't be unless you pay for it, uh, whether there is retweets or not, and uh, other information as well. So within just like four commands, we've essentially created a Twitter data set, a data set from Twitter. Uh, notice that there's only four cases, and yet we grabbed 50. That's because out of 50 cases, 46 were retweets. Uh, so... 
again, very important to think for your particular research questions and what you're doing as to whether you want to get rid of retweets. And for any given social media data set, then you need to engage in that kind of justification to really figure out, am I interested in retweets? Am I interested in reply chains? Am I interested in uh, any location on earth? Am I interested in geographic tendencies, etc.? cetera? Uh, and you can then kind of decompose all of that. Uh, this library also has a get user function, which if I wanted to look up who each of these Twitterers were uh, that have posted here and I wanted to learn more about them, for example, uh, if they reported, uh, if they self-reported gender in their profile, if they, if I wanted to grab their, uh, uh, their birthday, if they made it public, you know, whatever information is, is available, uh, then I could use different functions for that. So you might ask, well, how do I know how to do all of this? Uh, and the answer is, for any given uh, package, you need to look at the vignettes available that show kind of default ways to use the package. So if I do help package equals Twitter, you can see right here there's a user guide, package vignettes, and other documentation section with a PDF in it. And this PDF gives all of the instructions that you need in order to how to do this. So you can see from the beginning, oh, well, first you're going to need uh, to uh, authenticate with OAuth, and there's two different ways to do it. If you're in a headless environment, which you are because you're in our studio, uh, that means that you're not actually physically accessing a web page here. Uh, or you don't want to deal with the browser-based authentication tants, which, man, not dealing with things sounds like something I don't I want to do. Then it shows you, oh, we should use the full four password version. Great. Then it shows you launch your library, do your setup. Uh, then you can use search Twitter just like we did. Here's some examples of how it works. Here's how strip retweets works. Uh, here's how to get individual users, which we didn't do, but you could. Uh, and then how, here's how to convert into a data frame. So the way that I learned how to use Twitter is literally just reading this PDF and figuring out which functions made the most sense. For any given API, this is what you're going to do. Every single time you're going to open up, you're going to say, OK, is there an API um, that I want to access? I'm going to read the documentation for that API service. So I might go to Google and say, API Twitter. And I'm going to read about it. How does it work? Are there limits I need to worry about? Then I'm going to go our library, whatever it is, our library Twitter API, and see if there is one. And if there is one, then I'm going to read its documentation and its vignettes to figure out how it works. If there, Then I'm going to check what kind of authentication I need. I'm going to go to the website of the service. I'm going to sign up for their developer account, whatever it is. There's a lot of different ways it might look. Developers.something is common. Developer.something is common. Uh, but there are many uh, other options there, too. I'm going to pull down uh, sample data, and I'm going to see what it looks like. I might use the glimpse function, a very common way to do that that uh, makes it very easy. Uh, I'm going to figure out what kind of data I'm getting out, and I'm going to figure out what data I need, and I'm going to figure out what kind of chain of functions will get me between those two points. And that's it. That way I can grab any data I want from any API that I want. If I have to do it manually, I have to do it manually. But if there's an R library, I use the R library. And that will get you pretty much anywhere you want to go. There are, fortunately, R libraries for almost everything you'd want. Uh, if, you have, if you want to access something from Wikimedia, which includes Wikipedia, but also a lot of other uh, wikis, you can use the Page Views library. Uh, Wordnik has the Birdnik library. Facebook has R Facebook. Twitter has Twitter. You also have Qualtrics, which is really, I think, useful in social science, not for gathering data, but because you can use it to actually automate data pulls directly from Qualtrics. You don't have to log in through their really goofy, time-consuming web interface. You can just pull data automatically in real time. Uh, if you combine that with the data from last time, that actually gives you a way to, for example, run data summaries at will from a web page that you create. Say, for example, you are an IO psychologist working in industry. This is how you create dashboards, because you can basically have it pull data from Qualtrics in real time and then automatically display that in a way that's meaningful to you and then put that into Shiny so that any random person can come to say, oh, what did the data look like today? Uh, you wouldn't want to do that if you're doing like a null hypothesis significance testing kind of thing. But if you're just looking for actual data summaries in real time, you can stitch those two things together to create basically whatever you want uh, in terms of data display. Uh, Scopus and Web of Science each have packages. Uh, those are really useful if you do bibliometric research. Uh, we've done a couple of projects with them before uh, where you, know, you can basically pull down every citation about everything. It's also, also useful in meta-analysis to create data sets out of uh, uh, Scopus and Web of Science polls, all sorts of applications. Uh, data.world is, uh, is open. The OSFR data uh, uh, library to access stuff from the open science framework. Uh, you also have um, Swapy which uh, if you've not heard of Swapy, 
uh, I wouldn't be surprised, it stands for the Star Wars API, where you can pull down any piece of data about the Star Wars universe you might want. There's ship databases and planet databases and just any database you might want. It's actually a really great API data set to learn on. Uh, and frankly, as a first exercise, if you want to get into APIs, but you're a little scared about how to exactly do it, I would suggest looking at the Star Wars API and see if you can figure out a way to manually pull down Star Wars data because there's no limit on API access. It's all free. And if you get them really angry and they block you, it doesn't matter because you don't really need Star Wars data in R that badly. Um, so try it out uh, if, you're, if you're just learning. Uh, you also have the Google Maps API, uh, which is useful, but uh, they will charge you, or they will limit access if you try to get specific distances. It was for a project we wanted. We wanted to have driving distances for like everybody in our data set. It was seven or 800 cases. We didn't want to manually do that for every one. You know, the traditional way to do that would be talking to a, get a URA to sit in a room by themselves with no windows for two or three days. Uh, so I, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to pull it down automatically only to discover that Google Maps uh, does, even though it's capable of delivering that information, they want you to sign up for accounts and spend money in order to do it. So there's all sorts of different combinations of options available here, potentially, depending on what you need, what you want, how much money you have, uh, how much you want to invest in getting access, um, which may or may not be worth it to you depending on the uh, particular problem you're trying to solve. So all of that is uh, about, well, what do you do if there's an API and maybe the API has a li R library and maybe it doesn't. What do you do if there's no API at all? There's nothing. Uh, in that case, it's sort of similar, but we add some steps. Uh, and those steps are where that complexity I talked about earlier starts to really kick in. Uh, first, you download the file that, that you want, which is usually with download.file, uh, which I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, and then we uh, need to convert the raw data that we get out of it uh, into something usable. There are a bunch of different functions that you can do for this, like HTML underscore table or HTML underscore text, which will convert specific types of information into uh, uh, raw text that you can use in a data set. Uh, it does require that you learn a little bit about what are called XPaths or CSS selectors. And I have a couple of links there to introduce you to those ideas. But the short version is that a website is hierarch itself hierarchically organized in components. And XPaths and CSS selectors are two different ways uh, to identify a particular component or set of components on a web page. Uh, so that's that's the basic strategy whenever you're trying to get information that you want from a web page. Um, if you can't get to where you want to go using XPaths and CSS selectors, then your next option is to use uh, regular expressions, which we talked about many weeks ago, um, and using the Stringer library to uh, to use regular expressions to extract specific pieces of text from larger bits of text that you are able to pull out. Then you convert all of that into a data frame. If you don't remember HTML, we did talk about it before uh, a bit. Uh, and this is the basic format. Uh, in HTML, which is on the left, you have these um, tags, which open and close. Uh, and each set of tags defines uh, key components of this, of this web page. And this is, this is again, a, a very specific type of XML because these things mean things. In HTML, the word HTML is a tag, the word head, the word link, the word title. These all actually have semantic meaning, whereas in XML, there's no semantic meaning. People can just invent whatever they want. So you could have a tag that's just called like person, for example, uh, or case, or website, or whatever. Uh, in HTML, though, when we're looking for specific pieces of information, we need to figure out, well, where in the structure of the web page is what I want. Say, for example, you always wanted the title of the web page based on the first heading, then you would need to write code in this, for this website to say, all right, find the first H1 tag inside body uh, on every web page and pull that data out. That's, that's the logic of web scraping. Uh, it's relatively easy to do with a single web page um, because there are tools available to help you decipher uh, uh, exactly what CSS selectors or XPaths you need in order to kind of, it's sort of that you don't have to manually or mentally figure out exactly what the uh, XPaths or CSS selectors are. You can instead use a, a tool called Selector Gadget, which is an extension in Chrome, in order to I, automatically derive those CSS selectors or XPaths for you. So let's, let's try an example. 
this first line here, APA underscore HTML uh, to read HTML. We're going to go ahead and do that. APA HTML gets read HTML. And then we're going to get this web page, which I also have open over here. So this is APA.org uh, news slash APA. Whoop. And we need to do HTTR. Oh, no, this is our vest. <laughs> our vest. There we go. Uh, and in our vest, uh, using our vest, we've now used the read underscore HTML function, and we've grabbed this web page. And if you go to this web page, you can see all the data that are contained upon it. It's just a list of news articles. Let's say we wanted to pull out all of the names of all the articles that we've got. Great. How do we do that? Well, one way is to press F12 and go to the uh, elements section and try to navigate through the HTML in order to find the pieces that we want. So, so let's see. Uh, the way that you generally do this is you look for the blue parts, so blue and body. Uh, we're going to go here, and then we're going to go in here, and go in here, and go in here, and go in here, oh, go in here. Oh, we're almost there. Go in here and go in here. There it is. So now I've navigated like nine levels in and found precisely the data that I want. And that means this general pattern is, you can tell from the, just looking at it, this general pattern is probably going to be repeated for each of these, where you have an article and an H3 all inside this news list section. So if I go article H3 for the next one, you can see, yep, I get the next one right there. So the classic approach to doing this then is to look through the raw code and I used F12, if you didn't catch that, in order to open up the F12 key, in order to open up this, this developer console inside Chrome. Uh, and you would figure out what this pattern is and then figure out how to use X paths and CSS selectors to indicate that pattern. That is a lot of work, and I would not recommend you do it that way. Uh, I show it to you, once again, just to show, to, to communicate what it is that's happening when we do it the easy way. The easy way is in Chrome to get an extension called Selector Gadget, and you can find that through this, you know, the regular Chrome app store, um, and it creates this icon right here called Selector Gadget. When we click on Selector Gadget at the bottom, you're going to see this bar appear, and what that, and you also see notice this highlighting that starts happening. What Selector Gadget lets you do is pick the data that you want, and it will automatically identify the CSS selector or XPath in order to get those data. So we'll start off, let's say we want these titles. I'm going to start off by clicking on the titles. So what Selector Gadget has done is it has guessed what it is that I want. If you look at the bottom, you can see in the, in the CSS selector that it has put a big A. And what A means is link. So what Selector Gadget has done is assumed, oh, you want all the links. And so it's automatically selected those, and you can see them all highlighted in yellow. But that's not what we want. We don't want all the links. We just want all of the titles. So let's go up to something that is all, that is yellow, and you can see it highlights red around it, and click to deselect it. Still left-clicking to deselect, and you can see that the bottom that it's now updated, all A tags inside CT call. And you might remember CT call because we navigated down through that when we were going through that hierarchical list just a second ago. And this is almost right, except there's still something highlighted right there that we don't want, that RSS feed link. And if I unselect that, it changes again, news list A. And that very clearly maps on to what we found when we did it the manual way. But it just now it's just showed you. And you can very easily scroll through the whole list. Just make sure there's nothing else that's yellow down here that shouldn't be. Looks great. Looks like we're fine. And then you can copy this selector down at the bottom and use that in R. So now that we have uh, this, we're going to add in a nodes statement, which is essentially a way to, um, which is essentially a way to uh, uh, extract all of the specific nodes that we want uh, from the HTML file. And I'm going to add in my CSS selector right there. And you can see here that we found 67 individual nodes. And then I'm going to use HTML text. on the nodes that I just extracted. And there they are, all of the individual uh, headlines that I just found on that web page. Now, isn't that much better than copy-pasting? Hmm? This is really the idea, one of the major takeaways in web scraping, is that 
regardless of whether you use APIs or you even have to go through the nonsense here of doing manual scraping, of manually scraping web pages, it is always 100% of the time better than copy pasting data from individual web pages. You should never do that at this point um, for data collection. You should never be going to websites uh, and you know having a, a having undergraduate research assistants one by one copy pasting things out of it is a complete waste of time and it also adds a lot of error uh, to the coding process. So you're instead going to want to uh, uh, use this kind of technology in order to pull the data that you want. And at this point we could rerun that a second time and for example grab uh, grab all the dates. We could uh, let's see we can clear out selector gadget, rerun it. We can say all right I want these dates. Uh, oh, I don't, I want this date too. Don't want this. Do want this. Oof. See, it's been a little tricky. Don't want this. Do want that date. Don't want that. Oh, we're getting closer. Don't want that. No, that one wasn't right. We can try to slowly get in here to get to this date that we want if it's even possible, which it might not be. Ooh, it might not be. Yep, and the closest we might be able to get to is this, this set right here of these individual pieces. And you can see down here we have CT call article. And we might go back in here and say APA nodes two is uh, read uh, HTML nodes, and we're going to get it from the same web page so we don't have to download it again. Uh, APA HTML, and we're going to enter in this our new code. And now we can convert this into text using HTML text again to HTML text, APA nodes to. And now that we have this, we could use regular expressions, again, using Stringer to extract those individual dates. We can, once we have that list, we could then stitch it back together using bind calls uh, with the first list we had in order to create a data set that has one column worth of, um, one column worth of article titles and one column worth of dates. But that basic process of iteratively working through, like, how close can I get to the data I want? And then only once I'm confident I can't get any closer in terms of the node of the HTML I'm looking at, once I'm confident I can't do that, then dump it into text and try to pull it out with regular expressions. And you can see, for example, a very clear pattern right here. After the first backslash r backslash n, which is a carriage return new line, there's then a whole bunch of spaces and then a date. So you probably do a regular expression looking for, well, after the first big set of spaces, look for the second comma and just extract what you find between those two. And using the regular expressions that we learned before, that shouldn't be too difficult uh, to grab. But that's the basic idea. Uh, anytime that you are interested in web scraping, get as close as you can and then regular expressions at the end. But you can then see why APIs, if there is one, uh, and especially if there's an R library, is way better, and that's really what you want to do uh, if that's possible. Um, some other general concerns that you might want to worry about, uh, there are, you still have the same limitations as before in terms of uh, looking like a hacker. Uh, if you don't sleep, for example, two seconds between every query, it'll look like you're just hammering away at that web page, and that is the kind of thing that people do when they're trying to break web pages. It's a kind of hacking attack called a denial of service attack, a DOS. Um, and what happens in a DOS is that you just hammer the server with so many requests that it can't possibly respond fast enough, and it essentially brings the server down. So that's a type of hacking. Uh, and if you have your computer send requests as fast as it possibly can, you're going to look like a hacker, and you're going to get blocked from that website. So don't do that. Use sys.sleep. Also, only download each web page once. You don't want to write your code in such a way that you need to re-download 1,000 web pages a bunch of times. Write it in such a way that you're only grabbing it one time and creating that data set. Notice that when I just went back just a second ago, 
and tried to grab additional data from the website, I didn't re-download the website. I just used the save website that I already had. So you're generally going to want to save each of those website files if you can, uh, and then just reprocess them for the data that you want later down the road. That's also better for reproducibility because then, you know, in between when you scrape today and when you scrape a year from now trying to reproduce your results, the data set's going to change because it's going to be literally different data on the internet. So you're going to want to not do that. Uh, if you need to do dynamic link discovery, meaning if you want to scrape a page, look for individual links, then follow those links and scrape those pages, don't use R because R makes this extremely difficult in practice. Uh, it's just not designed for that kind of thing. Um, directory uh, and, and, and file writing is just very unnecessarily complicated in R. You're probably better learning Python at that point. Uh, the Scrapey platform is a, a popular way to do that in Python. It's very powerful um, and very easy to learn. Um, uh, one that you might see referenced is a, is a platform called Beautiful Soup, which is okay, but is a little bit more difficult to understand. Uh, the most time-consuming part of all of this is the data wrangling itself. That is now the research time commitment, is trying to figure out how to get the data we want into the format we want. Uh, the actual analyses that you run are going to be fast in comparison to this part. There's sort of a folk wisdom that when you do these kind of scraping projects that you're spending 80 to 90% of the time doing data cleaning and only 10 to 20% of the time actually doing your project. And that's very much accurate. As you are working your way through all of these uh, scraping issues and trying to figure out the edge cases and figuring out when it fails and why it fails and building in, you know, all of this, that's going to be most of the time you spend. The trade-off, of course, is that you don't need to actually collect primary data uh, in a traditional format, like with self-report surveys. So, for example, we collected about 150,000 cases worth of data for uh, a paper that's linked down at the bottom there uh, over a weekend. So your time is an investment in crafting a high-quality data set, uh, not in crafting study materials instead. So think about that trade-off uh, as, you, as you develop these. Uh, if you are interested in doing web scraping as a formal project, I have a link to a paper we did. Uh, we use Python uh, and we use Scrapey, but uh, the basic principles are the same, and this also goes a lot more in-depth in terms of uh, how to understand web pages and HTML and such. So if you find yourself going deeper than the API and R libraries kind of thing, um, the API access in pre-written R libraries. If you find yourself needing to go way deeper than that, I would really strongly recommend that paper to dig in to a really deep level. But otherwise, that's it. I, I hope you come away with this saying, well, if there's an R library, I bet I can do it. That's pretty much where you should be. Um, and if you want to tackle scraping a little bit, as you will for this week's project, um, you'll find that it's once you get the hang of it and once you start doing it, it's a lot simpler than it seems, especially with Selector Gadget. If you don't use Selector Gadget, no promises. Um, but if you use Selector Gadget, then it's relatively straightforward most of the time to grab the data that you want.